Welcome back from spring break. Not exactly how we thought we were going to come back from spring break, but here we are. So today, let's uh, we're going to work on uh, understanding and being able to use email. But before we do, let's pray. Father, we lift up our class to you now that we're moving to an online basis, and we pray this will really be great for everybody. And everybody will really do well managing all the different online classes they have. We also pray for our nation. We pray that uh, during this major crisis that we have, that you will pull our country together and especially give kindness to us in our financial um, economic environment in the country. In Jesus' name, amen. So let's go over to uh, email, and I'm going to share my screen with you. And here we go. So email. Email is uh, bigger than you probably know. It's, uh, there's so many emails that go out and you, you probably view your email as being annoying. And I know some of you don't even really like using email, but I, when you get out to the business world, you find that you use email all the time and it is a normal tool and then you're looking at it all throughout every single day. The, um, but it's also really huge with people in terms of selling. 40% uh, of people forward emails. Now, they were talking about sale information emails. S this is the, probably the most interesting thing. 60% of all online purchases are the result of an email, not a search. Hmm, I want to buy some Clorox from Amazon. So I go to Amazon, I search for it. Rather, 60% uh, of all online purchases, Amazon sending you an email recommending a purchase and you respond to it. 25% of all phone telephone purchases are the result of an email. And in the holidays, things get really big. Open rates to emails, so I send an email out, 12.7% of the people will open it. And the click-through rates go from less than 1% to 3.7% with a conversion rate. So a conversion is I see the information online in the email, and then I purchase conversion rates of email jumped to 7.2% during the holidays. So email is critical to the financial uh, stability of our online. Oh. oh, no. Rod, you sent this email, reply all. You hit reply all. You know, I was wrong. You just sent this email to me. <laughs> Could you imagine? <laughs> For drivers who want to get the most out of their car. Email, email, email. Oh, got one more. Oh. Come on. There we are. I have a question about the shareholder meeting. Uh, sure, just send me an email. But you're sitting right next to me. Well, just because we're on an airplane doesn't mean we change the way we do business. Just send me an email. Okay. Oh, another email from that suck up Brian about the shareholders meeting. Watch this. Till he's. Um. <laughs> Wi-Fi from GoGo. Now on AirTran Airways. Email. Okay, so some terms that we need to know about email. First is the delivery rate. That's also called the bounce rate. So the question with delivery rate is, did it actually get to the consumer uh, for them to open it and read it? So first we have a hard bounce. The hard bounce is when the server rejects it. So if Amazon sends you an email to your AU email address and AU gets that email and the, ser the first server and says, 
no, 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 we don't accept emails from Amazon, it rejects it. That's a hard bounce. Now you think, AU would never do that. In fact, AU bounces somewhere about a billion emails every year, just AU from places that spam, places that you don't want, uh, rejected emails. The second term is a soft bounce. So in a soft bounce, the server accepted email, but then it was rejected somewhere else. So it could have re been rejected because it was a bad email address. So the server would have delivered it, but the email address was bad. Maybe they misspelled your name in the, uh, email. Uh, it could be user listed as spam. So if you take your cursor and you go down on an email and you click and you say it's spam, then it notifies a use server that you think this is spam. So it won't send it to you anymore. Or it could be that you use the user's email box is full, right? Now, here's a note. <clears throat> as a business, if your ISP sends you a spam complaint notice, you cannot ignore it. Because what happens is, if they get a couple of, they have a certain number, if they get a certain number of spam complaints against you, your ISP cancels your service as a business. So for example, let's say, the corner bagel sent out a bunch of emails uh, to all of its customers that it's got on its email list. And 50 of those people said, Oh, I don't want to receive anything from, uh, from them. But instead, instead of sending it to their junk mail, they report it as spam. Then the ISP for uh, corner bagel would cut their, off their account, kill their website, kill all their email service, and not accept it anymore. Why? Well, spam's illegal. Spam is illegal. We're going to get to that later on in the lecture. And if they send you a spam report, then you have to answer back saying, oh, well, this person gave me their email in the past, so I was sending them to them in good faith, but I will take them off the, my future email delivery list, and then they'll accept your response to the complaint. But you as a business need to answer your complaints. Uh, some tips to get things delivered. First, make sure your list is good. So you should be going through your email list, and if somebody sends you something, I don't want to send, receive anything from you again, you need to take their name off. You need to be diligent to get their name off. Um, anybody who sends one of the, uh, you have an automatic uh, thing, if you don't want to receive this uh, email anymore, click here. When they click there, you need to take them off the list. Otherwise, you can be listed as a spammer and lose your rights to email. Uh, you want your from email. The, the, the line that says it's coming from, like when I send you an email, it comes from me at andersonuniversity.edu. You need to make sure that it comes from your email domain. So if you're the corner bagel, it's really good to have cornerbagel.com be your domain. And so it's you, corner bagel was sent an email from uh, soren at cornerbagel.com. And that's a valid domain. So if you hire someone to do your email from you, or if you go over to a different uh, email service, then maybe you run it yourself and you're running your email service and you just use the email service domain, you could be reported as spammer. Uh, so you want to use the domain name for your company in your from. Um, it's best to put the name in the field the two field versus the BCC field. So BCC means blind carbon copy. There's a CC, which is a carbon copy. So if I send you an email and I CC somebody else, you get it and they get it and you see that they got it. If I send you a BC, if I send you an email 
and then BCC your boss, it means it gets a blind carbon copy, which means your boss gets a copy of it, but you don't know your boss got a copy of it. That's the BCC field. Well, spammers were using the BCC field because you could put a thousand names in there and send it out and it doesn't deliver the names of every single person who got it. When I send an email out to uh, the school or off into a class, I will put everybody's name in the BCC list. That way you don't see everybody else's email address that got it and you can't click reply all and everybody in the class gets it. So, um, though you don't want to use the BCC field because uh, ISPs uh, view that as spam and so do a lot of lists. So, for example, if I were at home using my another one of my email addresses and sent everyone, all the students at AU, a, an, an email, then if I use the BCC field, then the AU server will think it's spam and they will reject it and we'll have a hard bounce. Okay. Uh, the other thing is to have a really good subject line and we're going to look later on at things that should be in subject lines, things that shouldn't be in subject lines and from that we're going to see how, uh, how to get viewed because the, email, the subject line is generally the most important part of the email because it's, you're gonna open it based on what that subject line says. Hey, I got this mysterious email from some stranger overseas. He's in some kind of trouble. Anyway, he needs to get his millions of dollars out of his country, and if I give him 10 grand to cover the bank fees, he's gonna give me half. Dude, I got an email just like that. We're both gonna be rich. Yes, we are. <clears throat> Bam. All right, so email. So let's go back to the email list. We wanna segment our email list. Let's say, for example, we have, uh, we sent out an email uh, for, and we have a 10% off offer, and we get a bunch of takers. And then we send out another email and it's a 25% off offer and we get a bunch of people respond. And I really don't want to send that 25% off email to the people who took it at 10% off because if they'll take it for 10% off, then that's all I want to give them. And there are different segments of the country of people who will buy at a 5% discount and a 10% discount or 20% discount. For me, it's a 65% discount, but uh, I don't want to send, people wouldn't want to send me a 10% email off, a uh, discount off, and people wouldn't want to send to me a, uh, or people wouldn't want to send to people who have a who will buy at a 10% discount, a 65% discount, because then you lose more profit. So some different segments that you have. How about new buyers? New buyers are very likely to open. If I buy from you and you send me an email, I'm probably gonna open that email. So send them another email because they're likely to offer and give a discount for something else to buy or a recommendation for some, somebody else to buy. How about how, mal, how much people participate? Yeah, so if uh, someone participates all the time, if somebody posts all the time about a product, then they're probably likely to buy. So I have a list of high participants and a list of low participants. Buyers who buy different things. Some people buy expensive things, some buy, people buy clothes, some people buy shoes. So if we segregate them according to what they buy and then send them an email according to what they buy, we don't send too many emails. I don't send them an email about a shirt when I know these are people that buy shoes. So. A list of heavy buyers, a list of light buyers, unresponsive buyers. Here's somebody who hasn't bought for six months, so I put them in a category, and I'm, I'm going to stop sending them emails for a while. And then maybe I wait four months, and then I send them an email to see if that gets them back. You know, they're annoyed at all my emails, so I give them time off, and then I come back. Maybe we do it to, based on demographics. Here are people who are... Get a high income, here are people at a low income. 
Uh, we could do it by engagement. What do they do or how do they react to your emails? Um, sometimes it's the source, how they got your email address. So if I gave you my email address, if I went on your website and signed up to get emails, boy, you ought to send me an email. Some of you have probably been surprised when you signed up for emails this uh, at the beginning of the semester, and some of these places didn't send you a welcome email. How dumb is that, right? And they didn't send you an offer immediately to buy some kind of deal. Thanks for putting, getting put on our email address. Here is a thanks. We want to going to give you a special deal. You're likely to buy at that point. Right? Yeah. So, and then it could be by lifestyle or it could be by how much they spend, their value. And always use the preference center. So in my website, I should have a link where they click, where they can click about preferences. And in those preferences, they can self-identify the kinds of emails that they want to get. And then I segregate those into uh, special segments and have a list of these emails that like this and a list of these emails who like that. So segment those emails. That means you get a good list. Okay. Keys that gets click-throughs. First is you have to have a good subject line, which now I say subject line first, of course, we want you to open the email. Uh, a few years back, the people over at the student services came to me and they say, Joe, we're only getting something, I think it was something like 7% of the students are opening the 411. And I said, well, uh, let me help you out. And so we sat down and I talked, looked at their emails and we talked about it. And the first problem was the subject line. The subject line for all the 411s was this week's 411. Well, that's not very exciting. One time we had a free balloon rides and it was, it was inside the 411 said this week's 411. Inside the 411, there was a free balloon ride. Nobody knew about the balloon balloon ride. We had a balloon out on the square about where the uh, student center is now and they had 10 people come out because nobody knew about the thing because nobody opened the 411. So I suggest what you need to do is put free balloon rides this week, free balloon rides see inside this week's 411. So oh free balloon ride. I'm going to open that 411. And then headlines. So when I open up and I look at the email, I first thing I'm looking for is I'm gonna see that big, bold headline. And if I'm not interested in that big, bold headline, I'm not gonna read on. So I, I glance down, this headline's okay, and here's a little content. And then here's another headline that, uh, that tells me something else. And, and I'm not interested in that, so I keep going down. And the next headline I am interested in. So headline's really good call to action. People do, we found out an email, people do what you tell them to do. So you need a call to action in an email. What do you want somebody to do after they read the email? Do you want them to click? Have a big click here. Do you want them to think about something? Do you want them to email you back? Make sure you tell them what you want them to do. And then the creative layout is important. So here I need to make sure I apply the principles of advertising. Where do I want people to look and in what order do I want them to look? So they follow the logical flow through, right? The next thing is send time. When should I send it? What time of day should I send it? And I'll be showing some things later on on all, most of these. Well, probably all of them. And so for send time, for example, if I send it at 10 o'clock at night, and they're not going to op get open their email till uh, six o'clock the next morning. Well, if you're like me, when I open my email, I go top down. So I s see the person who sent me something at six in the morning before I see the thing that sent me at 10 at night. So when we send it, it's very important to see, make sure that they're going to look at it, right? And then you want to consider how it looks in a different email system. So let's look at first automatic emails. So there's a welcome email. Welcome 
to our uh, service. So notice the one over here on the right. Welcome to Ingrid and Anderson. You know, are you hungry for a style? Here, click here, stop shopping, right? So then there are trigger campaigns. So if a customer changes something, they go, they bother to go in their profile and they click that they want to see emails about such and such, well, then you need to send them an email about such and such. You send them a automatic email that says, well, thank you, we noticed that you changed your profile. Here's what we saw that you did. We'll be sure to you know, do something or other with regard to that. So you need to respond. So you, it, a trigger is something is that happens. It's like a trigger or gun, it goes off. It makes something happen. So when a customer does something, it triggers an email. Um, a certain time period since their last order. It's been, we see it's been three weeks since you ordered with us. Uh, their birthday, notice down here, hey, it's your birthday, All right? Happy birthday. And then um, we wanna make sure that there's some dynamic content in there. So an email, email should be specialized according to things that people do. So you see this a lot with Amazon, you buy something and they make recommendations on other things you could buy. One of the things Amazon does very poorly nowadays is you buy something and then a week later they're sending you, or maybe a day later, they're sending you an ad suggesting that you buy it. You already bought it. That's because their automatic triggers are not set up correctly to realize they're, they're set up to see that you search for it, but they're not set up to see that you bought it. So they need some modifications there in their automatic emails. And then let's consider mobile email. 45% of mobile use uh, for mo cell phone use is checking email. Now you say, well, that's not true because I don't do that. Well, you're a college student. And, but once you get in the business world, your business email is going to be coming to your account, uh, your email account. And so you're going to be looking at it all the time. And 45% of mobile use is people checking email because most people work. So consider the display of your email on different mobile devices. So I send out, I make an email, I'm going to send it out. But the best thing for me to do first is send a trial email. And then I look at it. On my iPhone, I go look at it on a um, an Android phone. I look at it on the PC. I look at it on a Mac. I want to look at all the different um, mechanisms that a customer could use when they look at my account. So the other thing to consider here is a text-only option. So a lot of people, because they limit their data they turn their email to where they don't automatically pull down graphics. So if they don't automatically pull down graphics and your email is all in a graphic, so you've put your offer, your information in your offer in a JPEG and then attach the JPEG to the email and then send it out, then people who don't automatically receive pictures are not going to see it. So that says, offer a text only version. So here I format the email to where it's only text without pictures, right? Or I do it with pictures, but I make sure that it's also formatted what happens if they're not automatically downloading the pictures so I can see it. So on a PC, we see 80 lines of 80 characters on a line. On a, on a phone, we only see 20 to 40 characters depending on the size of the phone, of course, and whether I'm looking at this way or whether I'm looking at this way, right? So generally, 20 to 40 characters per line and under 40 characters works first. Now, if we think of a character. So character, space is a character, 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 character. So every place where there could be a, um, a letter on the line is a character. Okay? Now you want to pyramid your information so that I have something bold up here that says this is at the top, so this is really important, and then I have something lesser important, and then I have some other detail down here. Right? So also, 
have your call to action early. In fact, I suggest in every email, as much as you can, have your call to action at the top and have your call to action at the bottom. Because what happens is, is they scroll down to the bottom, they see your call to action. Sometimes people go back up to read the, a little bit of the email again, they read it again at the top, and then they have to go all the way to the bottom to get the call to action. So if you have the call to action at the top and at the bottom, things work really well. John McCain admits he doesn't use a computer. In fact, he doesn't even know how to send an email. <laughs> what a jerk. But Barack Obama has been using computers for years. And not only does he know how to send an email, he owns three email accounts. That's right, three. Barack Obama, infinitely more qualified to send email. I am Barack Obama, and I approve this message via email. So we email. have a little humor from the past campaigns. So when we think of email, we want to engage people. Kind of like social media, we want to view it as a dating relationship. So a personal greeting is really well, but you've got to be careful here because you've got to get people's names right if you do that. So if I got an email and it said, Joseph, well, I don't go by Joseph, I go by Joe. Uh, you want to make people feel special. So 80% of people send out emails, 80% of companies send out emails. Don't customize it. 40% don't personalize it. They send a mass email to everyone. But research shows that if you personalize it and make it special to people, they respond. Interesting fact, 60% of uh, emailers don't send a welcome email to new subscribers. Dumb, dumb, dumb. Okay. So you want to make sure the emails work. 40% of the effectiveness of emails is the list. 40% is the offer. That means I'm sending the right people the right kind of email. The one they're going to respond to. So I've, I've taken their profile and I put them into segmented lists that they will respond to. And then 20% is the creative look of the email. I mean, if it looks really cruddy, I'm gonna think cruddy of your company, but that's about 20% of what goes on. So let's talk about permission. You're gonna send me an email. How nice of you to send me an email. What if I didn't want an email from you? Well, if I don't want an email from you, it's called spam. No, not if it's person to person, but if it's business to, we're talking business consumer here. So we need to get people's permission. The first type of permission is an opt-in, where the, the recipient has agreed to receive an email before they're sent. Now, legally in the United States, you cannot serve, send as a business an email to someone before they agree to receive it. So an opt-in. I go to your web page, I ask you to send it to me. Okay? Then there's an opt-out. So here, the recipient receives an email until they opt out. So you send something to me, you're just expecting them to opt out. Now, <laughs> that's really dangerous. Now, <laughs> because it can't violate the law. I will throw this out at you. It is illegal to send an email that doesn't at the bottom say, if you don't want to receive these uh, emails anymore, click here. Or an unsubscribe, to unsubscribe from this email list, Click here. If that's not there, you violate the law. And we're going to see how that is a very strong violation. Then there's the double opt-in. Okay, the double opt-in is the best. So here, the email receives the email recipient gets an email confirming they want to be on the email list. So if I sign up for your service saying, yes, I want to get your emails, I click, I want to get your emails. And then you send me an email that says, we got, an, we got uh, a mark that you would like to send us, you would like us to send you emails. If that's true, please click here to make sure and we'll cement you on the list. That's a double opt-in. So I got your permission from the website, but then I sent you an email that you respond to, to validate that you really do want it. That's a double opt-in. Either way, you have to have an unsubscribe list on every email so they can be taken off. 
All right, let's switch the subject lines. Some of us will use a preview pane. So the preview pane it, on our email is, let me see if I pull up my email for you. So like here, there is, I'm not using a preview pane here. Uh, all I'm getting is the email and a few little words about it. But if I'm looking on my PC and I could arrange my phone this way to where it's got an email with a subject line over here and then over here, it's got the preview pane. Or maybe from where you're looking at me, it's like this. <laughs> and, um, but if you don't have the preview pane on, then people are not gonna see the content. And if that's happening, then the subject line is really critical. Over here, where I don't have this, what I do see down here, the little three lines. So I see and who sent it to me, I see the subject line, and then I have two other lines. If you don't catch me with those, with that little bit that I say, I delete you. So we don't get an open rate. If we get an open rate, we're not gonna get a conversion. Right? So the subject line has to be evocative. It has to be compelling. It has to clearly convey the content purchase, purpose of the email. Now, when I worked with uh, student affairs saying, um, so to help them with their 411, the first thing we talked about was subject line. Right? So um, first basketball game slash the 411. I know there's going to be stuff about the basketball game in, in here. So I'm interested in opening free shirts at basketball game. Now I'm much more interested in your email, right? So it's more compelling, right? So the subject line really matters. Uh, then, when, of course, the content doesn't disappoint. So one of the first things I told them to do as soon as you open the 411, people want to see what they're interested in. And the number one thing people are interested in is themselves. So I said, put pictures. And you rotate different, have different people's pictures. So people are taking candids all over campus all week long, and you pick several of those to put in there. So if somebody's picture is in there, their friends will say, did you see your picture in the 411? They'll say, no, they'll go open it. So I want to see it. And they see their friends, they're interested. So we want to make sure that they're interested. But the first key thing is the subject line. So to improve those open rates, a unique offer. Now you don't wanna mislead this with the subject line. So if I have a good subject line and they open it and it's bad, ooh, don't like that. Keep the subject line short. So generally the most you can have is 55 characters in that subject line. It's best to have 40 or under, right? It needs to be relevant to the people who are opening it. Uh, using numbers or statistics are very good to help. Uh, creating urgency uh, helps. Um, so the from line is from your company. We already talked about that before. I do wanna make sure you know it, that uh, humor is very dangerous in uh, subject lines. A 2006 study, I know that's a little old now, but uh, found that only 14% of respondents found subject line humor to be attractive. So in general, now that may have changed, but I doubt it. That's probably still pretty reliable. So, and then you want to prevent um, uh, spam filters at servers at places like AU to throw out your messages. So for example, if everything in your subject line is all caps, it's going to be thrown out by spam and it's going to get hard bounced. Um, if free is the first word, it get it's bounced. Uh, if it says save now, um, it, it, then it gets thrown out as a hard bounce. Right? So the other thing you want to make sure you do is test. So A, B, A, B, C testing 
come up with an email and send it to these 5,000 people with this subject line and these 5,000 people with that subject line and see which one has the best response rate and whichever one has the best response rate, send that out to everybody else. So notice here, click rates by industry. So you'll notice here that business um, products and services, we've got an open rate of about 20% and a click rate uh, click through rate. So I go in the email and I click something uh, to take me somewhere else. They do an open page for a website about 5%, right? So you can see by industry, financial services, retail is not as good. Uh, hotel, hospital services, travel services are pretty good. So let's look at some trends. Here, day of delivery or time, day of delivery, not time of delivery, day of delivery. So we want to see how good are the open rates depending on what day of the week. So you see that people open less emails on the weekends and during the weekdays, you're going to have more people open your email. So maybe what that says is either I send it out Sunday night or I send it out Mon Sunday night or Monday morning or Friday afternoon before they go out on weekends. So some terms that we need to know, um, the, ex the email is accepted, right, by the server. So we've got an accepted rate. It bounced or the bounce rate. So the, sometimes they call the inbox placement rate from bounce uh, to get to a, a past a hard bounce, right? And then we have some confirmed open rates, email render rates, uh, people are actually looking at the email. The average recipient render rate, the render rate is how many people are looking at it. And then we have the click through rate. So I click to open and then I click through to another page that you want me to look at. I'm responding. So accepted. Any email that's not rejected by a server, okay, is accepted. So I sent this many, I had this many bounced, that's how many were accepted. And I divide this and this, and I get my accepted rate, All right? So accepted rate, accepted emails divided by the number I sent, that's my accepted rate, All right? The total amount uh, successfully delivered to the email account. Bounce rate, uh, bounce. It's rejected by the server, hard, we talked about a hard bounce, right, or a soft bounce, right, then we have the inbox placement rate. This is the ratio of emails that are delivered specifically to the recipient's inbox divided by the total amount sent, right, confirmed open. So how many people open the email? Yes, we know if you opened or not, because when you open an email, it automatically sends something back to the company to where they know if it was open or not. Email. <laughs>
don't use false or misleading header. Your to, your from has to be correct. Your reply to, all that has to be accurate. You can't deceive people in who's sending the email. Number two, you can't use deceptive email uh, subject lines. So you can't say 50% off and then they look through the email, hey, nothing 50% off. That's spam. That's a $16,000 penalty per email sent. You have to tell your recipients where you're located. You have to have a street address or a post office box on the bottom of the email. Okay? You have to have their permission to send the email. The um, email has to clearly be an ad. You can't trick people into thinking it's not an ad when it is an ad. Okay? And you have to tell the recipients how they can opt out in the future so that uh, they don't get email from you again. So you have to have that unsubscribe link. You have to honor opt out requests promptly. So if somebody clicks that link, don't send this to me again, you have 30 days to take them off. And if you don't take them off within that 30 days, and 31 days after you send them an email, it's a $16,000 fine. Um, and then you might have to monitor those who do things on your behalf. So example, let's say I farm out and I have constant contact and they're doing my emails for me, but, and they do something wrong. So they don't have an unsubscribed list. You know who's guilty? You are. So that means you should be on the seed list of every single one, or somebody needs to be on the seed list for every single list of segmented emails you have so that you can make sure that the emails that are going out are what you want to go out because you're responsible for constant contacts mistakes at $16,000 per email. Okay, the GDPR, this is in Europe, that's the General Data Protection Regulation, which is a lot tougher than what's in the United States. And the GDPR, the penalty for screwing up with somebody's privacy information or sending spam emails in the, uh, in the European Union, or for any company that's selling anything in the European Union, is a penalty of 4% of their total revenues. Huge, devastating penalty. So, the GDPR protects basic identity of anybody, your address, your ID numbers, web data, like where you're located, um, your health data, your biometric data, your political opinions, and your sexual orientation, all that's protected. In the United States, we also have the CCPA, which is the California Consumer Privacy Act. So here, the penalty is uh, 25 million, up to 25 million. Um, and, um, it applies to anyone who buys, receives, sells, or shares commercial purposes to anybody in California. So that would be Amazon selling to anybody in California. Um, or any company that gets 50% of its revenues selling to California residents, okay? So it protects their personal information like where you live, who you are, um, what's your IP address, all that kind of stuff. And in both the European Union and in California, you have to be, you have to have the, you have the right to go in and check the information and edit the information and tell them they can't use your information, right? Big penalties. So in response, here's what the Huddle House did. We're updating our privacy policy, right? And all this is because of the California law. And you can see, there's a lot of information on how they're going to protect to make sure that they comply with California law. All sorts of companies were doing this. Okay. All right, so let me, I'm gonna have another email on the principles of email. So let me uh, cancel my sharing. Oh, Cancel that, yeah, now I'm messing up here. Uh, there I am, pause the share. Let me, 
There we go. Hey, I'm still learning. That's a, that's pretty. That's actually not too bad for me. Uh, enjoyed being with you guys today. Hope this lecture was uh, at least somewhat interesting. I've watched one of these myself, and I'm like, oh my stars, is this what everybody's putting up with? Listening to me in class all the time. Oh, I feel so sorry. So I'm trying to make this very fast. I've cut out a bunch of stories that I would have told in class to try to make it quick for you so that it's not too painful. So I hope you guys have a great one. Talk to you later.